So without further ado, let's welcome Maria to the show. How are you doing today, Maria? Yeah, I'm doing fine. Thanks for having me on the show, Jonathan. It's a pleasure. Well, it's good to have you here. The Earth Grid and Mother Earth have been favorite subjects of mine for a long time. On the astral plane, the first site I encountered, I was eight years old, and I was expanding my exploration range from my hometown in Indiana to other parts of the world. So I headed eastward. I go out of body, and I head eastward. And the first place I come to is this beautiful, glowing building. I don't know where I was, but it had all this earth energy coming out of it. This energy, it was love. This gigantic ball of energy. And I came to find out that was the Taj Mahal. I came to learn that there are many places like that around the earth where the energy is drawn up from the ground and It's imprinted with a human energy imprint, so there'll be emotion there. And I'm very interested in the Earth grid and the power lines that run through the planet. I followed Richard Hoagland and people like yourself for 30, 40 years or something. So what can you tell us about dowsing? How did you get started in that? How did that come about? Well, my interest in Dowson really started with my family because my late father was considered one of the UK's top master dowsers. And really, dowsing is quite easy to do. And, you know, and I teach it to students across the world. It's really very easy to do. But what dowsing really is, it's creating a relationship with like me, my dowsing rod. And if you're dowsing for earth energies with Gaia herself, So it's like a kind of three-way relationship, Dowson. It isn't just about finding underground water or energies. It's almost like electronics where you're the receiver or radio transmission even. You're the receiver and you're picking up through the divining rods. Is that what they call them? Now, that's a divining rod I've got in front of me now, Jonathan. It's copper. It has a sleeve on it, so my hand doesn't influence the rod, only the energies are wood. And it's made of copper with nickel, just to make it that little bit stronger. And as we know with our own homes, copper is a great conductor, so it picks up on energies quite fast. You say your father was into this. Can you share with us a story about your father, a favorite anecdote, something he said to you? Well, I suppose some of the fun times that I had with my late father when I used to work with him at ancient sites such as Stonehenge in the late 80s or 90s, there wasn't really that much restriction as you have now. So my late father either loved a pipe or a cigarette and He would do some dousing around Stonehenge and then just sit down quite close on the ground, which you could not do now, and, you know, puff away at a pipe. Or and sometimes have um, some homemade beer uh, with him as well, (laughs) which you could not take into Stonehenge nowadays. (laughs) Yeah, you'd end up in prison probably. (laughs) Exactly. It's so restrictive. You can't touch the stones. You can't eat. You can't drink. You know, you certainly can't smoke. You can't light incense. I mean, the list goes on and on and on and on. Can you go up to the site and walk around the stones? And With private access. I mean, I do have an account with English Heritage and I do get private access for all my groups, uh, workshops or tours. So, you, yes, you can and you can apply on their website as well. But you need to apply very much in advance because most of this year is already booked. Hmm. Now, dowsing, does that go back a ways, the history of dowsing? Did that come about many years ago or is it something that's newer? No, it's very ancient. One of the so-called earliest depictions of a dowser given a dowsing lesson is said to come from Algiers in a cave painting where it certainly looks like either one of two things. The person has a very unusual bow, or he has a very pronounced, what's called a V-rod. Cleopatra, she employed dowsers to search for gold, because you know that would make her obviously very wealthy. 
And throughout the ages, you've had dowsers such as Einstein was a dowser, Newton was a dowser, Da Vinci was a dowser. So there have been some very famous names associated with the ancient art of dowsing. That is interesting. And you can douse for gold or water? Dowsing is the ability to find an invisible target. Whatever your invisible target is, you can divine for. So in the past, I bored for wells. I don't do that anymore. I can water divine. And, but nowadays, I focus on earth energies and sacred sites. But dowsing is just three easy skills. Information dowsing, asking the rod, for example, is there any water associated with this area? And you think of a particular area. Yes. Then you use what's called directional dowsing. Obviously, I'm moving the rod, but it would move naturally. And directional dowsing would be, show me the direction of the nearest underground water source. And it points and you follow it till it goes found. And that's the key skills of dowsing, information dowsing, directional dowsing, and tracking to the targets. Sounds to me like it's part of what I call thought technology. We don't have thought technology here so much, but I can tell you that our race is more advanced than us use thought technology. This sounds like a perfect example where, from my experience, thought and intention is the most powerful force. You're using it in conjunction with this divining rod. That tells me the thoughts are guiding the divining rod to help you find what you're looking for. Exactly. I mean, that's what it is. Intent is everything with dowsing. The art of being able to visualize that which you're dowsing, keep that frame of mind going as you're tracking or trying to find the target and then being able to literally follow that thought pattern. So sometimes you have to take a break. You know, if you're walking long distances in an arid environment for water, you have to stop and rethink. But yeah, intent, you're absolutely right, Jonathan. Intent and thought is everything. If you have a weak question, a weak thought, you're not going to get a good dowsing response. The, the two must work in harmony. Hmm. Now, are you familiar with the Schumann cavity? You mean the resonance, the Schumann resonance? Yes. yes. Does that come into play with your dowsing when you're looking for something? Well, some of the tests that I've done around uh, ancient sites such as uh, Avebury and Rollwright and, and other sites besides, we've looked into whether the stones can emit particular energies or hertz frequencies. And you always get the Schumann resonance in the background. So you know what that is because it has a particular frequency, obviously. But then when we've used equipment, especially with Rodney Hale, and I've doused for the energy point on a stone, we've been able to record that signal as well coming from the stone. So I think, you know, that there's lots of different frequencies happening on planet Earth through the placement of stones, and they're releasing a frequency that is not the Schumann resonance. Yeah, the way I see it is the Earth is a living organism, and the Schumann cavity is like the aura that surrounds our bodies. And these sacred sites are set up a bit like chakras to channel energy. I call it rock tech. I'm always talking to Richard about this, where I think it's a lost art that actually came from Mars. And on Earth, we have Mars 2.0. We see the pyramids. And the best explanation I've seen for the pyramids is that they're built over an aquifer. And there's an effect you get when water is moving across the surface of limestone. It releases electrons within the limestone. The limestone is charged. And these electrons travel upward through the ground, put a, um, a granite block beneath the pyramid, and that acts as a magnet, and it draws these electrons up to the granite. And from there, they are drawn up into the chamber of the pyramid and then up through to the top of the pyramid where it was tipped with gold. And once that is charged up, the tip of the pyramid, it seeks, you know, it's like water seeking its own level. It ends up 
making a connection to the sky, which is also full of electricity, so that you get this open circuit, like you just plugged the ground into the sky, sort of. Mm -hmm. I'd just like to add to that. I think, yes, clearly most ancient sites are under a groundwater aquifer, okay? But in Dowson terms, there's a different aquifer. So you're talking about the groundwater, okay? Now, if we imagine that is collected by rainfall, through evaporation and that will fall back down and fill up the underground streams, etc. But there's a much, much deeper aquifer that is water produced by the earth herself, independent of rainfall, that is not groundwater. And I think much below that aquifer, the Giza Plateau, is a much deeper aquifer. And it doesn't just happen to be limestone that does that effect, actually, because at a chalk step pyramid, quite close to Avery that was eventually rounded off. The step pyramid was part of its construction and then it was rounded off in brilliant white chalk. With my own test, we have found that the electrostatic field is a thousand times greater at the top than at the bottom due to what you've just described with the interaction of a groundwater aquifer beneath a deeper aquifer as well. Because the deeper aquifer is like artesian in a way. It makes pressure beneath the rocks and it forces that water that's born within Gaia in vertical faults right the way up to then interact more with the ground water aquifer. So I don't think it's just unique to a pyramid. Would you agree that the Egyptians had a free energy system where they would charge up the pyramids? and it would power the staffs that they carry, remind me of our cell towers. There's a flame depicted on top of a staff, but I think that was a bulb, not an actual flame. I think it was a receiver and that they carry these staffs around and they were lit just the way Tesla put a light bulb in his hand when he's near his Tesla tower. The charge is coming through the air and into the body and then into the light bulb and it, it lights the bulb. I believe the Egyptians had a free energy system that they used in their daily lives, and they were probably charged a little bit because you have to maintain the pyramids and so forth. But I think this is all lost technology that has been glossed over, especially today where you have the energy companies that make a lot of money and <laughs> they have the power over the people. And my latest book is about bringing this technology out to the masses and the people that don't want that to happen and fight to keep their power. And yeah, I agree. I mean, they, it's about the money. But if you take the money uh, game, the gravy train boat away from people, when we look at the ancient system and some experiments done with that ancient system, you have these deep uh, aquifers beneath an aquifer, so to speak, and that can generate energy and energy travels very fast on a straight line. The ancient Chinese taught us this and they wrote down a lot about the ancient world in 2200 BC because one of their emperors, Emperor Yu, Y Yu, he was a dowser himself that raised the fertility of the earth he was renowned for. And in, in China, that's why you have all of the roofs slightly bowed because it slows qi down. And they claim that qi travels energy you could call it chi, you could call it what you like, you know, astral light of your Western occultist, uh, chi, free energy, travels really fast along the lays. So there was an agricultural scientist going back to the, I think it's the late 70s, early 80s, who decided to grow foodstuffs along so-called lays. And he was also um, quite a competent dancer in his own right. And he found it was really stunted on the lays because the Chinese were probably right. There's still that vestiges of some energy traveling along that line. Now, with lays, if they go through a house or something, that's deemed, you know, not really quite positive for one's health, either because of the energy. Now, if you imagine that on a global system being generated by whether it's, you know, Silbury Hill in, in England, the pyramids of Giza, the pyramids, you know, in Arabia, or Mexico, wherever. And other stone circles as well, I think, were a part of that system. But just quintessentially British, for example. 
So I think all of it added to a very large energetic system. Now, this person, I think his name was a Dr. Lay, who first came up with this idea, at least in modern times. He was, uh, was he a scientist? It's been a while since I've read about him, but he came up with these supposed lines around the earth that are charged energetic avenues of energy that come from the earth and that you can tap into these in some ways. Is that a good summation of the ley lines? It's an interpretation, but you see, when we look at lays in the UK, the most well-documented ones by an author called John Michel, and we look at particular lines, they often are orientated towards a solar or lunar event, normally a solar event. So, for example, one of the largest lays in the UK points to the Beltane, that's the Celtic day of May the 1st, sunrise, and the Samhain, that's the Halloween sunset. So the solar energy, I would presume, needs to interact with the earth energy as well. I don't see the two as separate, okay? Because even if you have a stone circle and all stone circles, and a lot of the temples in Malta and elsewhere are never more than 1.5 miles, three kilometers from a fault line. Now, where you have a fault line, and especially granite stones, for example, or granite structure, when the sun or the moon moves over the horizon line at sunrise and sunset, you get like a sheer force effect, a bit like a wave motion, and that bathes the megaliths in a mild form of uh, piezoelectricity. So again, I think there's lots of different factors rather than just, you know, like a lay par se. I think it's activated at particular times of the year with the sun at particular points on the ecliptic belts. I agree. I think it's a sophisticated technology with many parts. And it's something that's just been lost over time. And boy, it would be nice to have this technology become a common household thing where we don't rely on the electric companies anymore and everyone has pyramid in the backyard or whatnot. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I think whoever would implement that would be locked up in jail on trumped up charges. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. Would you mind telling us what your first experience was with the lines of energy? Because you seem to be, I find certain humans are more drawn to this technology than others. And you and your father obviously are drawn to it. And I think this even goes back to, I believe in reincarnation, and that perhaps you lived at Avebury before, or Stonehenge long ago, uh, possibly you were in Egypt, or all of the above. And have you ever had any kind of metaphysical experience that led you to believe you had lived a previous life near any of these sacred sites that you study today? I've been practicing past life regression since 1996, and I had the great pleasure of being the very famous uh, Dolores Cannon's tour guide for, for uh, many years when she was active with bringing her QHHT past life regression courses to the UK. And yes, I've had experiences, deja vu. I felt uh, that I was very connected to what's called the Neolithic. That's the very early phase of Stonehenge or Avery. And I think it was my connection, uh, a kind of sense of being there before, like, like you said, to put it simply, that led to one of uh, my, my discoveries of the long-skulled people, as well as dowsing for barrows and coming into contact with information about that. But I really do feel that, yeah, for sure, I've, I've been around uh, here for quite some time, and also as a druid in, in the Iron Age, I've had a few regressions that have outlined particular elements of past lives, one of which was being a druid. Very cool. Now, you mentioned these long skull people. What can you tell us about that? How did you get involved with that research? 
People have known about long skull people through the fantastic work of Brian Forrester with the Peruvian uh, coneheads and uh, etc. But nobody had really associated them with Great Britain at all. And of course, I'd, I'd heard of the, the cone hen, heads of uh, Paracas. And I got drawn to a particular point on the Salisbury Plain, which is quite close to Stonehenge. And uh, just for, for your uh, listeners, you know, the, Sto the Salisbury Plain is a military establishment. Stonehenge is surrounded by numerous military establishments, okay? That's 16, if not more, surround that stone circle. And I got drawn to this particular barrow, so I thought I'd go and visit it. It was a day that you couldn't because they're firing the military. You have to get permission to go on to this particular point, which I did. Then I started reading what's called the Antiquarian Reports. That's who was the first person that dug into this barrow, where is the skull now? And then the descriptions were that it was very strange. It was long skull. It wasn't like our skulls. So I thought I'd track it down and after much ado I tracked it down to a top university went to see it and she had a very extended skull there she was a female probably a high queen or a high priestess of Stonehenge because not everybody went into these magnificent earthen monuments we had flat graves probably you know you and I would go in like you do today it's six feet under that's called a flat grave in archaeological terms so uh, I then investigated all the other long barrows surrounding Stonehenge and a lot in the British Isles and France and uh, Malta and elsewhere and it seemed that it was like a long lost civilization that nobody was talking about. Makes you wonder if this is something that's worldwide. They're going to end up finding these long skulls in just about every country is my feeling. I think you're you're correct there, Jonathan, because I think at one time, you know, there were two two or three species of humans living side by side. Uh, clearly, because in some of the barrows in a county called Gloucestershire, that's like another state to you, I live in Wiltshire, Gloucestershire is another county, there was round-skulled people buried next to long-skulled people. So that clearly, and they were the same dates, so that clearly states in that part of the British Isles, they were living side by side. Now, you were talking about the Isis Pendulum in uh, one of your videos that I watched. How did you get involved with this pendulum? And can you tell us about some of the history of it? Yeah, the ISIS pendulum, which I'll show in a moment, because I've got a, a pendulum quite, uh, quite close to me, uh, came from ancient Egypt. And there were two French diviners called Chaumarie and de Belizel. And back in the sort of like 1930s and the 1940s, Egypt, I am um, uh, sad to say, was a free-for-all, whoever dug wherever they wanted to dig if they had the funding. So the Germans were digging there, the English with Carter and Carnarvon, and so were the French in the Valley of the Kings. And these uh, two uh, chaps were very used to uh, pendulum dousing, and they noticed that over the heart area, or we could say the heart chakra area of, particular, of a particular mummy in the Valley of the Kings was an energy device, which they called uh, a pendulum, although they are energy uh, devices. And then they went on to have a look at the paintings in the Valley of the Kings, uh, certain depictions in Abydos and uh, in Komombo temples. And they realized that this energy device was everywhere. And uh, then this is the energy device here, which I'll hold up to, to the webcam. These are called batteries here, these bits, and it's in two. You can unscrew it. When it's not in use, you must unscrew it, and it comes into three parts, and if you wanted to do absent healing, this is the focus of what's called the witness. So it's a, a screw-up device that just by itself uh, according to the, the French research, generates a frequency of the sun, God, Ra, uh, of the ultra white, which is all of the colors of the rainbow. The, the French team went on to realize that it's not just the electromagnetic spectrum, that's the color of the rainbows that the sun emits, but it emits uh, a frequency called the negative green, ultraviolet, and infrawhite, 
and infrared. And these colors can have different meanings and application when you use the Isis pendulum for healing or clearing. One of them, uh, called Traumary, decided to fill an object with this so-called negative green using an energy device. And he was found by De Belizel a week later, completely mummified in his laboratory with no smell of you know, fermentation, no uh, uh, rotten uh, smell, as, as it were. So that went down in Dowson history, you know, that these colors of the sun in an energy device like this is very, very uh, powerful. So I got introduced to Egyptian pendulum dowsing by a European master dowser uh, many years ago who trained me to tune into the colors of the sun at particular times of the day or particular times of the year to kind of relate to this energy device. And it's very good for clearing, uh, whether that's your aura, your chakras, or a house or land. I mean, it's, it's very, very diverse. Yeah, again, most people wouldn't think that a pendulum would be considered technology, and yet. That's the thing, you see, modern day pendulum dowsing came from the 1960s. It's really not that old, uh, where you ask it a question. Before that, uh, a pendulum, like the ISIS pendulum here, had a purpose. You don't ask it a question, it tells you where the imbalances are. That's the difference between using an energy device and normal uh, pendulum dowsing. So they're, they're very powerful, and most people can feel the force of, of the energy. And I think they were probably used throughout ancient Egypt. And you only have to look around Abydos, and that is everywhere. Now, some people would say it's called the spine of uh, Osiris, and that's the explanation for it. But uh, others would say, no, it's an energy device. It's a bit like what you were saying earlier. Were the staffs more technology minded or was it just a staff? <laughs> you know, you have to kind of address these questions and maybe think outside of the box. It's not just a staff. It's not just this. It's not just that. And realize that they're normally to do with some type of energy. Yes. Now, you mentioned Abydos and... I've heard you say that Abydos and the Hypogeum and I think Avery are some of your favorite places on Earth. <laughs> They're, they're, they certainly are. I mean, uh, I'm just going to, just before I answer that, put together what's called the Karnak pendulum. And that's the, the Karnak pendulum, which is the male version of the Isis pendulum. And when it's not in use, again, you must unscrew them because they're generating high energy. I really do like Abydos. I resonate to uh, Abydos. And Avery is the largest stone circle in the world. And the Isle of Malta, has some of the most spectacular temple spaces, which has to be the hypogeum for me. So, so yes, they are some of my favorite places on earth. Yeah, I have a feeling if you did a past life regression, you could well find yourself at the hypogeum you know, 2,000 years ago. And then <laughs> here you are today doing your work like you did back then. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. Now, what can you tell us that um, you haven't discussed in, you've done a lot of interviews, I'm sure. And what can you tell us about your love of this field, your love of this subject matter? What does it mean to you? And you go around to these conventions and you give talks, right? Yeah. Where does that come from? And like, I, I guess I'm talking on a spiritual level. Where do you think that comes from? Is this something that arises from past lives and they just resonate with you? Would you agree? I think, yeah, I think some of it is, is past life. But what I really do feel uh, over, especially over the past uh, two decades, is there's more and more of a disconnect with our planet that we live on for most people. I mean, you're clearly a very aware person and you're awake, as they say, you know, you're awake and aware. 
Uh, but for a lot of people, there is a disconnect. And I think for, for me, uh, it's taking people to ancient sites or teaching them Taoism to say, this is your reconnection to the earth upon which you live. And I think once we're connected back to the earth, the earth teaches us. I know that because some people might say that sounds a little bit naive, but I really do feel once you have that connection, and that could be in your back garden, you don't have to be at Stonehenge to really connect to the earth. And once we have that, people change. Their lives start to change, and they、uh, and the earth, I believe, teaches us where we should be, what we should be doing. So my inspiration comes from the the earth. Uh, Gaia, and also I'm a. As much as I was an ancient druid of the Iron Age, I'm also a practicing modern day druid、uh, at、uh, ancient sites here. So my spirituality is very much in nature, which is what druidry is. Living druidry today is about the trees, it's about the water we drink, it's about honoring the earth and the forces of nature, which are, were personified as gods. For example, Thor, thunder, you know, and and that type of thing. So for me, it's about connecting and connecting others to the earth. So you give tours of ancient sites in in England. Is that right? And Egypt, I'll be going to Egypt in April and、uh, November, and next year Brian Forrester and Patricia Arian and Susan Moore have just asked me to join their team, and I'll be working with them in Egypt in 2021. When you do these tours, do you witness some of this taking place where people are awakened and and they? They go from not getting it, you know. They have their lives where they get up and they go to work and they come home and they have families. And, <laughs> and I would imagine you see some transformation in some of these people where they they visit these sites and they feel something they've never felt before, and there there's a connection made. That's probably very rewarding. It, well, it is because a lot of people say, you know,、uh, not necessarily me. It's the power of place. You put somebody above some very powerful types of earth energy, and there's there's gentle earth energies, there's stimulating earth energies, there's spiritual earth energies. You put people into the energy fields. Uh, at an ancient site or elsewhere, and you do see a transformation. So I say to some people, like before going into Stonehenge, this is living alchemy, and they nod quite dismissively, like、oh, yeah, okay, living live, live alchemy. And then for some people in in the right place, it's just that eureka moment, and、uh, people feel that they get downloads of information, or they just release emotion. Something has changed. So sometimes it doesn't matter what the change is; it's the change has occurred and has made them aware of themselves to maybe live their life in a little bit different, differently, or to change it completely, as some people have, or just to have the knowing that the site has、uh, whispered something to them, and the energies have whispered something to them、uh, is is very a beautiful moment that can be quite emotional. I agree. I, it makes me think of. Well, it was like 25 years ago when I went to America Stonehenge with my girlfriend and a few other couples, and that's what I saw in some of my friends who were not that spiritual, not that aware, but coming away from that place changed them and just made them think about these things that we're talking about that they really had not thought about before. It was not a part of their world. View. So, another thing I I want to bring up is: Do you feel that there are? I guess first, do you think that there are aliens? And if so, <laughs>、um, have you run into any situations or experiences where someone photographed a UFO over one of these sites, or maybe you felt the presence of? Because I believe there are aliens all around, but they vibrate at a much higher frequency, so we just don't see them with our eye. And they go about their business with impunity, and they're doing their thing. Meanwhile, humans are unaware. They know about the Earth grid, and you know it's all part of their basic science. 
but have you ever had anyone who's taken a photo or reported any kind of UFO activity around these sites? Oh, you have the uh, the crop circles. You get a lot of those in England, right? Not so much uh, these days, but yeah, in the past there has been a lot of crop circles around uh, the ancient sites, but that is lessening uh, each year at the moment. But you see, uh, at some of the, the power places like Stonehenge, and there isn't any, anywhere else like it in the world, it's a lintel stone circle. It is you know, truly spectacular, and it has big vortex, and it has everything, earth energies, earth currents, lays, grids. Uh, it's all there. And loads of people have seen UFOs over Stonehenge and in, over Avebury and over these power places. And I myself have as well. In fact, it was only two weeks, two or three weeks ago now, Jonathan, that the British female astronaut, Helen, but her second name escapes me, so forgive me for that, came out in the British media, in the papers, and said that the aliens are amongst us. They're walking and they're very like humanoid. And of course, you know, some paper supported her, some trashed her, as you could uh, imagine that the media, especially the British media, is prone to, to do. I, I myself think there's a lot of um, uh, activity, UFO activity in this area. In fact, when I went on the UFO Hunters show, when they came over from America to do a series on vortex and ancient sites, uh, there kind of mantra, if you will, was sacred site, military base, vortex, UFO. That's what they were saying during that show. And certainly, I think a lot of people, local people, would, would agree with uh, is definitely UFO activity. One that I saw myself was quite spectacular. It was an ancient site called Oliver's Castle, renowned for uh, an, an ancient site. It's quite well known in this area if you're a Brit. And I was up there on Midsummer's Eve with a friend celebrating in, in our, our style of our culture and honoring that time of the year. And a huge object that was kind of like amber color, like a circle headed towards our direction, but obviously not personally to us, but it was heading in our, our direction. And we're now on very elevated ground, okay, quite high uh, hilltop and then it's it suddenly literally stopped appeared to go backwards a bit and then before our eyes started to expand to like three or four times like into like a mothership cigar shape was uh, solid at the top and seemed to have a whirly mist at the bottom then it contracted to its former size and just disappeared hmm. that sounds like you're a little bit crazy <laughs> that's what i saw yeah oh, i i believe you i uh, a friend of mine directed me to a video that was um several people around uh temple mount were filming this ufo over the dome so it was neat because you have several people filming the same thing from different angles that's spectacular. Yeah, and of course, for me, I see that. I'm like, oh, yeah, they're just charging up, you know, the, the aliens. They, they use these areas um, like a gas station, if you will. They're similar to departed spirits in the way that we can't quite see them. Some people can see spirit, but... I think there's a lot of activity, like you said, going on all around us that we're unaware of. And people like um, the astronaut you mentioned, Buzz Aldrin is another one you know, who walked on the moon there. He has come out to say that there's a monolith on one of the moons of Mars and that, that should, we should take a look at that. And so more and more, you find that people are coming out and, and risking the ridicule of the media and stating what they, what they believe and what they've seen. I think this goes back to the galactic alignment that happened recently. There's a change, and depending on how humans react to this change will determine the course of our future as a race. And 
I like to think of it as a great awakening. And hopefully in my time, I'd sure like to see this disclosure come where we find out that we're not alone, that we have a legacy on Mars, um, all these many things that have been hidden for so long. And uh, what do you think about the galactic alignment? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think when things come together in time and space, you know, whether that's an alignment or even your thought pattern to that alignment, you know, because a lot there was a lot of focus on it. So our thoughts are aligned to it. Then I think it can bring about change. I think, you know, planetary alignments and we, we've got quite a bit of planetary activity this year with Pluto, you know, and, and Jupiter, for, for example. Then, yeah, it can strike change. But I, I really do feel that um, it's about getting the message out there to other people as well so that we work uh, more hand in hand. I mean, part of my work uh, last year and previous years alike has been taking children around ancient sites. Last year, I suppose I taught about 100 children how to douse and interact with Earth energy. And I think it's about a re-educational program of integrating our thoughts, your thoughts, what you feel are a truth and knowledge, uh, and it's passing that on to a younger generation. And then, and then that seed in that younger generation can bring about the change. So I think it's about, you know, inspiring our young, younger people. And part of my role at uh, places like Avery and Stonehenge has been fortunate enough to get those kids. And once a kid uh, realizes there's something else going on and something made that rod move and they didn't and they do it again and again and again, then they realize there's more to heaven and earth, as Shakespeare said, you know? Yes. Have you read in the news about Betelgeuse, that it might go Nova? And mm. there was a story uh, yesterday that there was this gravity wave hit Earth, and some people think it was from Betelgeuse, and it's, it's going to go boom um, soon. And the way, you know, in my model, I see the Earth and our solar system is speeding through space around the galactic center, and everything's turning, and oh my gosh, look, this is, this is one big engine the galaxy is like a torsion engine and the spin, you know, it's this Richard Hoagland spin model, I guess. And so things like Betelgeuse exploding might not seem to have any effect on, on people on earth or on your daily life. But I think that the stars and their positions and their spin in relation to us does have a, a subtle effect. And it affects more the collective consciousness more than an individual. What do you think about Betelgeuse going Nova? Well, I hope I get to see it, and I hope that it does. I think it would be spectacular. And I think, again, it, it will kind of draw humanity to realize, to look out there. Yeah, for the average person I'm talking about, I'm not talking about people that are kind of wide awake and switched on. It will let people, a bit like when Hale-Bopp came round, uh, there was a surge of interest in the paranormal, uh, UFO magazines and things like that. For the average person, thinking out there rather than about their own lives and soaps and what they normally do in their daily life. So I think, yeah, I think these events take us out of ourselves. Yeah, there is a bigger picture, and when you take a step back to look at it, it can be very profound. I've had uh, a positive effect on a few folks around me over the years that, well, like my sister, for example, she's not into the paranormal, or you'd consider her very average and normal. And she was telling me that she was uh, making her bed one morning, and my father passed away some years ago, and she had a feeling that somebody was behind her watching her. And so she turned around, and lo and behold, my dad is standing in the doorway, and she kind of did the blink, blink, double take, and he's gone. But 
She said, dad was standing right there in front of me. I saw him clear as day. And things like that can change your, your view. And I think she's more open now to, because I've kind of been the outsider in my family where I'm, you know, this crazy out of body guy. What, what's going on? <laughs> I was brought up in a Christian background and so forth. And uh, wow. so it's nice when you, you can have a positive impact on someone who did not have these thoughts or views before, but something happens to them and, oh my gosh, Jonathan was right, or boy, Maria was right when she told me about this this place to go to. And can you share with us a story of someone close to you? Do you have someone, a friend or a family member that has been affected in a positive way by your research and your work? Yes, I think, you know, again, there's, there's put, like I said earlier, you put people in the right place and changes uh, do, do happen. But I'd just like to, to point out that I think we're talking about personal one-to-one -one things, which is, which is a wonder. But when we look at the size of Avery Henge, for example, it is over a thousand feet in diameter. Okay, Stonehenge is, you know, just uh, over a, a hundred and so feet. It's, you know, much smaller than Avery Henge. And I think these places were collective where everybody changed. Because they, you could fit thousands uh, in, into Avery. This wasn't about one kind of person. It was about a collective uh, experience. But one experience that I really did uh, in, enjoy was uh, recently, about two to three years ago, I took a great Italian group. They're so enthusiastic, the Italians. I, I, I love them. I really do. And we're at a stone circle proper that uh, Avery and Stonehenge are no longer circular in shape. They've been destroyed. You know, they've uh, uh, but that roll right you have a circular shape so it behaves like a um, stone circle proper and because I've been going there for years I know it affects your mobile phone and you may as well just switch it off because it's going it's going to get but people love to take pictures and they have their iPads I get it yeah I get the other people want to do that but I always do a little warning well you know maybe leave it all to the end don't carry them around with you and anyway, people were taking pictures, and the next minute the phone started to go down, the iPad started to go down, and uh, you know the little swipe cards you get for going into hotel rooms? Mm. They wouldn't work when they went back to the hotel. <laughs> so their, their phones went down for a while, and uh, that's the, the, the power of, of the place, because what we don't realize is that we don't see what's going on. We can't see the, the energies. Some people can, but most can't, and we can't hear what's going on because it's uh, roll right uh, particular scientific studies have shown that it at particular times of the year it emits ultrasound not into the stone circle but away from the stone circle as if irrigating the, the landscape sort of with with sound and sound has been uh, heard being emitted from the Avery stones as well by a school group that I took out they were so excited Jonathan they came running over to me in one part of the uh, monument it was on the edge of a thunderstorm. I always think that dynamic played a role. And they said the stones are singing in that sector, Maria. Mm. I said, what? They're, they're emitting noise. So I think atmospherics, you pull something together and the, the stones are constantly emitting infrasound or ultrasound anyway. The tests that I conducted with Rodney Re uh, Hale over a particular point on a standing stone that we think is a bit like a chakra for want of a better explanation mm -hmm. uh, emits uh, frequencies of around uh, 18 hertz so that's that's you know that's that's infra, um, infra, infrasound so i think all of this is going on at any one time in a power place i agree and the atmospherics are part of the equation so do you have any thoughts on how weather modification they spray constantly here over in the Boston area. It's tic-tac-toe skies. I think it's unfortunate that a lot of people are not aware of this. I, I worked at Harvard for a number of years, and I would just now and then I'd be chatting with a, a student or a professor and, uh, you know, standing outside on the sidewalk, and I'd say, gosh, look, what do you think about that? And I'd mention weather modification 
and people would just look at me like I was nuts because nobody can control the weather. Come on. So what do you think? Do you think the weather modification is affecting the sacred sites and the energy that's coming out? And the other question is, does 5G, what does that have? There's a lot of people raising the alarm about 5G energy. So what are your thoughts on weather modification? In this area, we do have, and I think you meant by tic-tac, like noughts and crosses or gridded. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we don't have that expression, but I, I know about the, the skies like that. We have that over here in England, that's for sure. So I think weather modification is a global uh, and not exclusive to one place. How the long-term effects on the energies, you know, uh, I can't honestly comment, you know, on that. I really don't know, but I obviously anything that interferes with Gaia is interfering with an, uh, a highly attuned energetic system that will have a knock-on effect. Cairo is one of the most densely populated places on the planet. It has 23 million people living in a very small area. That's the whole of the people in Australia <laughs> in Cairo. Wow. Okay? It, it's that big. Now, there's some Egyptian dowsers over there that have for, for many years been looking at what's called the Hartman grid. The Hartman grid was discovered in the 1950s by Dr. Ernest Hartman. It's thought to have been quite benign, unless there's a big earthquake or an event that's you know, unprecedented. It will kind of vibrate and give off what's called geopathic stress, negative energy in a nutshell. That's what geopathic stress is. But with the, the advent of 4G, and this is before 5G, they feel that the Hartman grid is flowing with 4G. Now, if you have a grid that is surrounding the Earth and it's contaminated and polluted, that is not good because that grid is only 2.5 meters apart. So that could influence you know, people's lives, uh, and in, especially in densely populated areas. So I think with the advent of 5G, like Shakespeare said, something wicked this way comes, uh, I feel that the, the natural lines of force, not the earth currents possibly, but the lines of force like ley lines and grid lines will become contaminated if the Egyptian model is correct and in built up places, it's flowing with 4G already. So I think we need to be very cautious uh, because if we're surrounded with that, not just with masks, but over us with a grid, that has got to be detrimental to one's health. Yeah, I agree. There's another site that I've researched. It's the Kaaba in Mecca. And I find it interesting that People walk in circles around this cube. The cube, as you know, is the second most perfect form in nature after the pyramid. So you have this cube and you have many people walking in circles, creating a torsion effect. Creating, and they're, they are thinking. So here we have more thought technology. I don't think most people look at it this way, but when I see these people walking around the Kaaba and they're thinking, to me, their energy thoughts are being amplified by this cube and sent out into the collective consciousness. So it's kind of a prayer amplifier. And so when I have people ask me what they can do to improve their lives, people that are maybe down or they have an injury or they're depressed. I tell them to just face some structure, whether it's an obelisk, you know, there's obelisk all around the world. There's pyramids all over the world. <laughs> there's all these structures that act like amplifiers on a circuit board. And like the Muslims, they turn toward the Kaaba and they, wherever they are on the earth, and they send their thoughts and prayers toward that. And it doesn't matter where you are, it will pick that up and amplify it. So 
that's what I, I tell people is just to, um, you know, if you live like the Capitol Dome in Washington, D.C., for example, or the pyramid in Las Vegas, or there's some obelisk in New York City. Uh, they're just, there's quite a few when you start looking around. And I think prayer is a very powerful tool in the metaphysical model. And if there was someone here today with us that was down and they were having a tough time in their lives, do you have any advice? Um, because we're running out of time here. And I like to end the show on a positive note. Mm -hmm. What would you say to people who are looking for just a better a model in their lives or something that gives them hope? Do you have anything to offer on, along those lines? The land is healing. Gaia is healing. So I would say go out to wherever it feels good. Yeah, uh, it could be in a wood. It could be in your back garden. There's that special little place. Now, that special little place is probably an earth voltage or an earth current. OK, stand on there. You can you can keep your shoes off. You can keep your shoes on, whatever you feel. And just breathe that energy from the earth up through the soles of your feet, up through your kind of chakra system to the top of your head and then back down. Leave it in the heart area for a while and, you know, think about what it is that needs healing, what needs changing. Ask the Earth Mother to help that and then let it go back down, back into the earth. And do that a few times on any area that makes you feel good. You've connected to Gaia. You're probably connected to Earth energies. Earth energies can be very healing and transformative. And they can also be loving, nurturing, and kind, just like a good mother. So I'd say it's easy, it's free, and, you know, go out and experience that. It, it is a wonderful thing. That's some good advice, Maria. On that note, I'd like to thank you for coming by today and sharing your time and your knowledge with us. And I hope you'll come back again and visit with us. Definitely. It's been great. Thank you for having me, Jonathan. You have a great day, Maria. Thank you so much. And you.